Hey everyone, good morning. As you can see, I'm not sort of in my best head right now. I've, I've sort of, it's it's very nice. I had some friends come in from out of town to help me celebrate the book doing well. And these are, I'm very, very fortunate. These are friends from, I'm a kid and all of that. So I've been managing all of that. So mm -hmm, this isn't a whole situation that look, looking so great, but I'm here and that's what's important. So good morning, good morning to, from Los Angeles. Some of you are already veering into the afternoon and are fully into your day. So I'm really happy to be here. And again, today we're a couple of reasons we're doing the live. Just a reminder, each week this book seems to kind of find its wings um, and, and stay in a position that gets it more attention. The good thing about the attention is it gets it, it means that there's more media opportunities and more people hear about it. Something that's been heartening for me is people who said, I got, I got, I got a text message through a friend who said she was at a doctor's appointment. And a nurse had said to her, you know, so it's, uh, they were just chatting away because the friend had to have a long procedure done. And long story short was that the, um, in the conversation, the nurse like, oh, you know, I'm my, it's been a tough time. My sister's going through whatever. And she's like, I didn't even know about this thing called narcissism. And I listened to the show, da, da, da. And there was this person and they said they had a book and I ordered the book. And my friend who I've known since I'm 19, she said, I couldn't believe it was your book. But the reason I'm saying this is important for that one person and the sister, and they didn't know it was a narcissistic relationship. The sister got it. It's like, oh my God, this is it. I didn't know. Sometimes when we know something, we think everyone knows it, right? And yet every time we lift our head, we're like, oh, there's something I don't know. It happens to me every day. So th I think that this is, I know all of you in this community, you, you, at some point, all of us, when I didn't know, um, all of us didn't know. And then we knew. And then even when we knew it was, easy, it was harder. It was, I mean, so it was hard, it wasn't harder. But then once we knew we had, if we, if we were fortunate, it helped us let go of some of the stuff we used to get into with them. Like, okay, I see, I know what this is now. And we interact with it differently. So in many ways, I view a lot of you in this community as almost emissaries for this. Like you, you've gotten out, you've posted about it, you've talked about it. But like I said, the bottom line is this. While the book sits on that list, for better or for worse, there's plenty of fantastic books that aren't on that list, and there's plenty of not very great ones that have been on it. Um, that we're going to, I'm going to thank this community. And that shows up in these lives and these ongoing raffles. And just as a reminder, it is Saturday. So tonight at midnight, whatever time zone you're in, so your time zone. Okay, you if you order a hard copy or an ebook and can verify that, just it's easy. You just go into the link that's either in the Instagram bio or in the video notes and give your and you give very minimal details and you just verify that purchase, you'll be able to get access to our live virtual retreats happening in May and it's at least 6 hours. Um and we're again, once we're off the list, we're going to actually put that up for people to purchase it. And then you'll also get an entry into the raffle each time you purchase another book and verify it. It's another entry into the raffle. We've had lots of winners so far who are winning things like the grand prize being tea with Dr. Romani. Those of you who are like, oh, I just like to get a question answered. Well, that's what's being raffled off as well as a whole bunch of other stuff, signed books and book boxes and other, and other fun things. So to get entry, you've got to, you've got to verify, you've got to buy it, hard copy or ebook, you've got to buy it, you've got to verify it. And you need to do that by midnight in your time zone. And the book's actually quite affordable on Amazon right now, 30% off. So, and everyone has it back in stock now. So thank you again. We're going to do some, but we're going to keep that conversation going this morning. As always, I'm going to ask you for questions. Um, we'll do some questions. I have to, I actually have to get to an appointment this morning, so I won't drag it out as long today, but some questions and you guys gave me magnificent topics um, yesterday. And honestly, if we don't get to all of these and you, next net Wednesday surprises me again. Like I said, this Wednesday surprised me. So if it doesn't happen next Wednesday, there won't be an ounce of disappointment and you won't have to be in these insufferable lives with me. So let's, um, let's go from the top with some of these topics you started talking about. There was a quote I read yesterday and I thought, Oh, I want to bring this into the live. I typed it into my phone. I was so um, taken with it. It was a Faulkner quote. Um, let's see. It, the Faulkner quote reads, uh, William Faulkner wrote, the past is never dead it's not even past. And I think that that's, it was such a, I was reading it in a larger article somebody had written about grief. And then I went back to the original Faulkner work. I'm like, oh my gosh, how did I miss this? So the past is not, you know, past is never far. It's, it's, not, it's not, past is never dead or whatever I just said. It's a, it's, it's such a profound quote for people who are gone through narcissistic abuse, because the thing that so many people are told is 
it's okay. It's done. Their parent is gone. Your parent's dead. You don't talk to your parent. The marriage is over. Get over it. It took, it took a novelist to come up with a line, which I think that more psychologists have to lean into. And I think I made a comment about this in the live yesterday. One of the things that kind of gives me pause on a lot of the sort of the positivity culture that I see sort of splattered all over social media and things like that of think differently. You can be differently. You don't, you, your past doesn't define you. It doesn't define you. Define is the wrong word, but you better believe it's a hand at your back and it makes things hard when for someone else it isn't hard. So then we feel that there's something wrong with us, right? Well, I, I gave an example yesterday even of that. Why is this hard for me? Because the past does matter. The past is never dead. We carry the past in our nervous system. Because if we didn't carry the past in our nervous system, we would not remember where we ever put our keys or we would never remember how to drive somewhere. We can't get, we can't get part of this. We can't get like, I like that part of the past when I can remember how to do something, but I don't want to remember that part of the past. It takes me to a point I've made again repeatedly, but I think some of these things bear repeating how important it is to have a coherent narrative about what happened to you. And by coherent narrative, a coherent narrative isn't either dissociation is not a coherent narrative because that means you're just sort of like, no, nothing happened here. Everything was fine, which is I hate to say it what some of these social media people seem to be pulling for. That's not coherent because that's not true. Something happened to you and it bears reflecting on because something happened to you doesn't mean you're defined by it, doesn't mean you're damaged, but it did. So you have to make sense of it, right? That's that whole meaning and purpose piece. So there's the dissociation, la la la, nothing happened here. Look at how good everything is. Mm, that's not coherent. It's not a coherent narrative to blame yourself. I'm going to use the example of, because a lot of this happened for folks when you were in childhood. You're not to anything, anything harmful that happened to you as a child. And I'm going to say it here and I'm going to say it again and again. You are not responsible for that. You might say, but my parents were struggling. I understand that. And I'm sorry for your parents. You weren't responsible for that. And that lifting of responsibility, or how can I be better to be loved? That's just being given a distorted script that worked for the adults. But to create a coherent narrative, part of that coherent narrative may be, I don't know, I'm making one up for one. Um, my parents were too young to have kids. They weren't able to manage us. They were working through their adolescence on our time. But the final part of that, I'm always going to say when it comes to narcissistic abuses, and it wasn't okay. It wasn't okay. It happened and you understand it. You might, and you have, might have, a, again, a very coherent narrative around it, but you say it's not okay. That not okay part's really, really important because that's the piece where, because everyone's concerned. I get this every day from folks. I don't want to do this to my kids. I don't want to show up like this in the world. The fact that you're even monitoring it means that it's far, far less likely. Do we have our moments? Yep. I was snappy with someone last night and I like, why was I snappy with this person? And I broke it down. I'm like, oh, that's why I was snappy. I immediately went to the person. I said, you are helping me. I should not have been snappy with you. I'm so sorry. And, and the person helped me. He's like, I know why you did that. And that was a loving thing for that person to do because they know me. But at the end of the day, we take, we take accountability. And for him, me saying like, mm, not okay, the whole thing becomes bearable. None of us are perfect, but that coherent narrative means we're catching ourselves or we don't do it that often. You have to give yourself that gift. And, and the book is a lot about that. How do you craft a narrative that's not about this, you know, only about like, I'm not enough and all this other stuff that you're fine and something happened to you and what happened to you wasn't okay. You can understand it. And when you do that, the likelihood of repeating it becomes far, far less. So just want to always put that, I want to put that mark in it because I'm always going to take it back to it's not okay. And the past matters. And anyone who tells you it doesn't, I don't know if they have one of those men in black zappy things or something because it does and it affects us. One of the other questions, again, these, these lives are disjointed because the topics I get are disjointed, but it's okay. I think everyone, I'm hoping this answers something for everyone. One of the topics that somebody asked me about, and it came up from two people, so that's why I sort of put it at the top of my list, was the concept of the empath and even the super empath. The, you know, again, the tricky bit with the, the designation of being an empath, it's actually not a construct that's been fully articulated in the field of psychology, meaning there hasn't been good research on it. And what I really think the, the empath or the super empath is, is that construct, that personality construct of agreeableness at a pretty extreme, like a very, very high level, sometimes almost to a fault. 
because empathy is such a strong part of agreeableness. But I say to a fault because the super empath is so present with the emotion of the other, it takes a toll on you. And that's when empathy has gone too far because having empathy, while it may be uncomfortable, it shouldn't bring you to a point of significant noticeable distress. And so the, the, the super empaths and the empaths around there, you almost exhaust yourselves in the um, attempting to, to attend to other people, to be there for other people. And the biggest problem with being a, this, this sort of this hyper empathic, super empath, to call it what you will, is that then you're chock full of excuses, right? Because by definition, a super empathic person almost wouldn't lay down the line and say, this is not okay. It's always like, well, I have to understand their point of view too. And once I fully understand their point of view, I can understand why maybe there is part of this is okay. No, it's still not okay. You might understand it. I think that where the super empaths are a danger is that they're still always trying to find the okay part of it. You can understand someone, like I said, without it being okay, that's sort of the lead in to this whole super empath thing. To me, the super empath is really a place where the agreeableness almost meets the fawn response in an excessive way. And because the fawn response is involuntary, and I want to always remind people of that, you're not fawning because you're manipulative. You're not fawning because you think it's like, it's not what we I've called, and I think other people have too, but I've called it fluffing. Fluffing is an intentional playing on the narcissist. So a great place fluffing works is at work. You've got a really narcissistic boss. You need something from that boss, whatever it may be. And so you really pump them up. My God, you know, like I can, I'm so lucky to learn from you. Like nobody gets this better. I can't believe I get to learn from you. Like, I don't even understand how you got this far at such a young age, fluff, fluff, fluff. And then, um, and then you get the thing you might need and then you're done. You're like, this is, this feels gross. And I'm going to take a shower. You're very aware of what you're doing. The fawn response is not voluntary. You are not, this is not something you're doing intentionally. It's very reflexive. It's to keep you safe. So there's a difference, but that fawning combined with that agree, hyper agreeableness to a fault, like I said, any personality style taken to its extreme is a problem. That combination is where this all gets, um, is all where this gets very problematic in narcissistic relationships. Listen, if a super empath, hyper empath person found a good human being, a nice human being, even then there may be the, the risk, if you will, of the other person in the relationship saying, you know, this is a lot. Like, can you just, like, I can figure this out myself. Like you might, there's even a risk of hyper, super empaths of almost like slightly suffocating another person in trying to be so helpful. But it is almost a natural pull for the very empathic person. And they will, they sometimes, if you're, a, and this is what I hope for super empathic people, is you find that place to just sort of take care of you because you're going to burn out. It's something we were taught when we were trained as therapists. If for initially, I'd go home and cry every day. I was doing my clinical training like, I feel so bad for them. It's not that I don't feel for people, but I, if I cried every time I worked with someone, I, would, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed. So we we can trim that. But, but that risk of emotional burnout very high for the super empaths and the hyper empaths. And if I could say to one thing for, and where does it come from? I think partly it's temperamental. You have that very agreeable temperament. And it's very likely that a child born with agreeable temper, a very agreeable temperament, really sweet, easygoing kid who comes up against a narcissistic parent and recognizes the way to survive in this environment is to completely yield to this parent and make sense of them and do what they, in all the conditional transactional nonsense, that honestly, I think is one major breeding ground for the hyper empathic person. And so it's a, it's a hard thing to step back from. I think hyper empathic people are gorgeous, but I always am worried. I, I'm always worried they're going to burn themselves out and they often, they often do. But you can imagine in a narcissistic relationship, it is, it's just havoc. It's terrible what happens to folks and how many times hyper empathic people will go back. You've got to just build that one sentence into your vocabulary. I get it. I know why they're doing this, la, la, la. And it's not okay. If we can get you to that, it's not okay piece. I think that you can probably step back a little, hold on to that gorgeous empathy and not get as harmed, but also recognize it as a, a vulnerability. It's like a goodness in the world. And any of you who took a, a literature class in high school or college knows that that really perfect creature that always got destroyed in the end, right? They'd always kill off 
that person in the novel. I don't want you to get killed off in this novel. I want you to get enough edge that we don't need to sacrifice you. Because I think that idea of too good to be true, the novelist always knocks that character off. Almost as like, you're almost divine when you're that empathic. And I think that there's a real risk in that because you can't take care of you properly, you can't take care of others around you sometimes properly. But more than anything, narcissistic people, bosses, everyone will run roughshod and that's not okay. That takes us to post-traumatic growth. Somebody asked about that. And again, there's a section in the book on it. It, it was actually a late part of the book. I, I put into a, a late section of the book. In fact, it was one of our later revisions. I said, we need a section on this because people want to know, like, am I doomed? Like, am I always going to be at this level? Hell no. I mean, you're, there's, there, I think the healing and growth after narcissistic abuse is limitless, honestly. But the, the post-traumatic growth literature is really interesting because I, I did the deep dive, I read so much stuff. And what I really found was that some people argue that what post-traumatic growth is, is this idea that everything happened that happens post-trauma isn't bad, right? It's not just hypervigilance and hyperarousal and avoidance and fear and nightmares and, and all the things that happen after trauma. There is also sometimes this sort of, if you will, this, this shift in, and some people argue it's a shift in personality. And it's a, a certain form of a I guess it's almost like where resilience meets circumspection meets something happens in a person and some people actually really drill down and there's like a, there's a, like, again, a wisdom that comes of it. There is a, a realistic seeing of the world. Many survivors of narcissistic abuse go through it and post-traumatic growth can exist alongside post-traumatic stress fallout. So that same person who's still having some of that hypervigilance some of that avoidance, some of that anxiety, it's still coupled with a, a, a growth in awareness, a change almost in your personality, the way you go through the world. It, it's that it, it happens. And some of it is this creation of the coherent narrative, the meaning and purpose oriented work. When we look at Viktor Frankl's work, a lot of that related to post-traumatic growth, you know, some of the most horrific trauma recorded. And yet he was seeing consistently this trend of some people who went on to do actually quite extraordinary things in the wake of that. We see this in refugee crises around the world. Is it everyone? No. And I've seen when I've worked with, um, especially even narcissistically abusive systems where there was other more severe forms of abuse, when there's multiple siblings, I will see that, one will have experienced that post-traumatic growth, not everyone. Sometimes that early resilience someone has, as those hyper empaths, you're at a little bit of an advantage here. Some of that early resilience that that is part of that's inborn can actually then combine, which is why all of us know at least one person who's been through significant trauma and came out the other side, again, quite extraordinary. And again, it doesn't happen for everyone. And a lot of it has to do with the severity of the abuse, how close you were to the abuse, how long it lasted, and how quickly you were able to get either some form of help or some form of safety or support. For some people will say, I would have been destroyed if it wasn't for this one grandparent. And so, or this one person. And one person I worked with, she said, what saved me was I was a little bit good in school. So the teachers liked me. So I knew about six hours a day, I'd go home and I'd get abused like nobody's business. I got abused before I left the house in the morning. It was before all the child abuse reporting laws. This was an older person. They said, but I love school. And that one space, because the teachers liked me, it kind of got me over, you know, over a little bit of a hump. Another question. Now, this is, again, this is another topic. It's the idea of, we talk about family roles, right? The scapegoat, the golden child, the, the, the fixer, the peacekeeper, the truth seer. It's detailed at length in the book. And many of you are going to read that list of roles and you're going to say, oh yeah, I'm, I was definitely a truth seer. I knew something, this was not right. And I was also a scapegoat. A lot of truth seer, truth teller kids become scapegoats. So too do some of the fixers as the invisible child, all of that. There was a type I didn't put in the book. So I was actually glad somebody asked this. So you're kind of getting a bonus here. The editor pushed to take it out because her belief was nobody who was in this role would read this book. Okay. So I'm happy to bring it here because I was bummed to leave it out. She was right. And we were struggling with length at that point. So we took it out because she was right. Nobody in this role would read it. But I thought, but their siblings will. And she's like, I get it, but figure out another way to tell them. Here I am. And that other role is the brainwashed child. 
the word brainwash has come under a lot of scrutiny and anyone who does cult research is like, that's not actually a good word, but I'm going to use it here because I think a lot of people know what I mean. The brainwashed child is actually all in. They actually might defend the narcissistic parent or caregivers. You're so mean to mom and she works so hard for us and you're the problem. You're a bad kid. So literally it's the sibling that's <clears throat> so deep into the narcissistic family cult that they will be combative and they will defend it well into adulthood. In adulthood, that brainwashed adult child. Now this can happen a couple of ways. It could be you're a group of siblings who recognize that one or both of your parents was narcissistic and you have one sibling that says, you are so disrespectful, you don't get this, you're so mean, you're so terrible, you don't do anything. So it leads with me that. Or tragically, in some cases, it could be the adult child where you might have been in a, your own child, where you might have been in a relationship with someone narcissistic. The narcissistic co-parent really got a bug into that child's ear really convince them of your awfulness and terribleness and, and you know, that you never had, ha you never had their best interests at heart or all the ways they hurt them or whatever they, they fill their head with. Right. And then that child, then you now have either lost your relationship with them or they're harsh with you or they completely have a misrepresented sort of take on the scenario. And that likely would have started maybe even as young as childhood, but certainly can ramp up during puberty and adolescence. And then in adulthood, you may very well have lost your child. There's a range of issues that could be happening here. There's no one, I can't say every time this happens, you're going to lose your kid and, or that every time this happens, that there's a solution. There is no perfect answer to this. In some cases, when people have this adult child, that's sort of been commandeered by the narcissistic co-parent, in some cases through patients, sometimes through therapy together, um, through continually showing up and not getting into the mud. Some people have seen that turn around, especially, especially if that adult child actually starts to see some of the terrible behavior of that narcissistic co-parent. But this is the hardest thing to say here, though, is some of you that's never going to come around, that that adult child will for, forever remain they'll believe what they were told. It literally is like people who go into a cult and they leave their family and they never come back out of that system again. It has that feel to it. And it is probably one of the most eminent losses I've seen people experience, especially when they fought hard for that kid because of the narcissistic co-parent and family court made whatever cockamamie decision that they did and, um, and a harmful decision that they made. And then they, um, and then that's what they, um, and that's, and that's what you're left with. And the grief around that is it's, it's monumental. It's monumental, the grief around that. And it's, um, many people, you know, will spend lifetimes grieving that because it's your child and it's a child you may very well have fought for. And as I said, I've seen it happen both ways. And there is sadly a point of radical acceptance because some people will put themselves in harm's way. They will try to give that adult child money. They will keep <clears throat> reaching out every year, every few months and kind of lose their own lives. The parent who's lost the child will lose their own lives over this, like <clears throat> not be able to maintain relationships and all the rest of it. So the, that idea of the, of that, that, brainwashed family member, whether it's a sibling in a larger system or your own adult child, it's so, it's so difficult because you may only be able to get so far. Let me just cough this one out. <coughs> um, this sort of takes us to a related topic, which is the aging narcissistic um, parent. And, the, and with the aging narcissistic parent, what we see or the aging narcissistic person, forget parent, any aging narcissistic person. Again, I wish I could say this was uniform. There's an interesting research area in psychopathy, psychopathic people. Psychopathic people lose some of their steam as they get older because it takes some energy to, um, it takes some energy to sort of um, commit crimes and manipulate people and work the angles. Like it, it, antisocial personality disorder, for example, it sort of ages out a little bit because there is a certain amount of energy, but people who are psychopathic or antisocial will often find themselves living on the fringes as they get older. They might've burned all their bridges. They might've not had any residential stability. They may not have access to money as they get older. 
<clears throat> and so as a result, they may, again, they, you might see, again, they may not have steady places to live. Their family wants nothing to do with them. That's at the more severe end. Some narcissistic people might develop dementia. For a large subset of those, they might become even more mean, but some may just sort of lose all. They, it's almost like a deflated balloon kind of thing. It's just all gone. And that can bring up a lot of grief and pity where you see this once formidable and almost frightening person, adult from your life. Now you're older. They're much older. And that can bring up some very strong feelings too. Um, so the aging and narcissism though gets very tricky when we're, we're not talking full blown, like things like dementia and getting into older life. But as a person gets older, I mean, let's face it, I can say this is a person who's getting older. The body kind of stops working, right? Our hips hurt and our joints hurt and you can go and work out. And there's all these people, what are they talking about? All this, um, What's it called? Hacking? Hacking, aging, body, biohacking, something like that. Like, I'm going to live forever. I mean, I think this one, the, the narcissistic folks are going to have a hard time giving up on this idea that they're going to die someday, but I don't think we're going to figure that out. That's not how life works. And so not only just the psychology of impending mortality, but our body is giving out, right? I mean, you're your skin's not what it once was. Your boobs start to sag. Your ass starts to sag. Your hips don't work. Your, you know, no matter what, it's your. It, it just none of it works. And you can get all the procedures you want, but now people know what you're up to, and, and you know, for all of it, you, you, you lose your hair. You, your everything atrophies. You can't have sex in the same way. It's all. It all changes, and that loss of power that people have had, either by being attractive or that kind of. Again, that sort of, I don't know how to call it potency, maybe, that a person brings into the world. That's a, um, you know, th that's a whole, uh, that brings up a lot of ego injuries for narcissistic folks as they get older. And so you'll see a lot of tension around that. That might make them more frustrated. It might also leave a narcissistic person much more preoccupied with how can I look younger? How can I look younger? How can I look younger? And and they're going to get more and more irritable because they're also, if, if you retire and leave careers, the power you might have gotten from a professional identity, that may fade. So you might watch a narcissistic parent who leaves their career start to get a little bit more irritable and, and crackly and all of that. So by and large, the picture of aging for narcissistic folks isn't pretty. If a narcissistic person has a ton of money, so they're able to create a really nice older life for themselves, traveling and living comfortably, and maybe people still come around because they do have money, that can look a little different. Most of us don't have a lot of money. And so aging can be a very perilous pet place. So the narcissistic person you knew is younger might be getting a little bit more difficult and they don't have the same ways of getting supply. Then there's the issue of <clears throat> then there's the issue of enablers. Somebody asked about in the book. I break down the different kinds of enablers, and there are many different kinds of enablers, right? There's the Pollyanna cheerful enablers, and it's like everyone's got the good in them, and the toxically positive enablers, like let's just figure it out. There's that piece. There's this narcissism thing. Come on, now we're a family. We can work this out, sort of thing. There's the enablers who want to maintain the status quo at any cost. There are the enablers who are benefiting from the narcissistic person financially or otherwise. There are the enablers that are mildly narcissistic themselves. We, you cannot in your healing process underestimate the impact of the enablers. You cannot. It is, it is remarkably powerful because the enablers often were people you considered allies and friends and may still, right? But there's also the voice of like, are you sure? I don't know. Maybe you're being harsh on them. Like give them a chance. And you're thinking, are you kidding me? If you're supposed to be my friend, my person, my backer, and you're saying this, that shift in status quo, they may be willing to support you while you were staying in the relationship, not so much when you kind of pull out of it. So there is that entire enabler piece, again, which I can't give, I'm going to give it short shrift here because it's a, it's such a big topic, but I think a lot of people are thrown off. Like, why am I so being held back by the enablers because it's really like a pack of wild horses holding you back. It's not just about, okay, I'm going to be thrilled to get rid of this um, narcissistic person from my life. This is going to be great that I don't have to deal with this. Okay. Wonderful. But the problem is there's this whole constellation of folks around. You're like, mm, yeah, I'm not ready to give up all of that. And that's where this gets tricky. And, and because it can be almost just as hard to, if you will, share your point of view with an enabler and have them hear it because that could be just as difficult. Um, you can, that's the word I'm trying to use here. Y you may find it then that you are, um, 
you're fighting the same fights with the enabler that, uh, that you were with the narcissistic person. Um, taking us to a next topic, and in about a minute, I'm going to start the questions. Um, are is is this a sort of an intent? Are the narcissistic people doing what they're doing intentionally? To that, I'm going to say, ish. There's part of it that is intentional in the sense of that's where we get into that sort of covert, overt narcissism. They show up as narcissistic in some places and not others. Their ability to know, I'm not going to scream at you in front of other people because I don't want people to think I'm a bad person. But when I'm alone with you, I'm going to let you have it. Or I'm going to get in the subtle digs, but I'm still going to really put on a great show for other people. That's intentional. Like That takes a minute to sort of figure out like, okay, we're in front of other people. Now, at that time, the nar if you said to the narcissistic person, do you see that in front of other people, you're oh so charming and in front of when we're alone, you're mean to me, then they'll gaslight you. So when you pick up on the trend, when you pick up on the pattern, a big error a lot of us make is like, aha, I got your number. Let me tell you, I notice what you're doing. When you notice the pattern in such an obvious way with a narcissistic person, they're going to shut that down. Okay. They're going to say, uh-uh, no. And so the, the, and then they're going to gaslight you. So this is why I'm saying it's one of the narcissism healing 101 things is don't let them know, you know, it's your, it's like the winning card in your back pocket kind of thing, but you don't want to show it. And that's the, that's a big, big healing strategic piece and all of that in here. But the rest of it is like, they're not, again, they're not, most narcissistic people aren't sadistic. They're not getting off on hurting you. Please, that's not the case. They don't care about you, okay? Because that caring requires empathy, but they don't care about you not because of you, but because it's just not how they're wired. But they're also not intentionally trying to bring you down. They're just trying to maintain power. It can feel like they're trying to bring you down because them being up means you have to be down, but it's really their content. If like, if they're almost their attitude is if you just stay down, I would need to do these things to you, but they're never going to say that out loud. Right. But it's really that when you're trying to be your full, you express your needs, show up as an equal in the relationship, they're going to push you down, but it's not, it's not to harm you. It's to keep you down. Even though you might say, wasn't well, that the same thing? Sadistic people get off on hurting people just for the sake of hurting people. And that's not always the case here, other than the most, most, most malignant narcissistic, um, most malignant narcissistic folks. So th this intentionality piece is tricky. I do believe though, that they are, they do have that capacity. That's why I'm saying it's not delusional and it's not like they completely have no idea what they're doing because they know to scream at you. They know to yell at you, not when there's other people around, or they know how to be charming in front of people whose supply and regard they still need. But if they feel like they've locked your supply in, there's no need for them to be nice to you. Now, some people out around you will say, well, that's what we do with the people we love and trust. We can just be ourselves. Well, apparently being themselves is being emotionally abusive. And remember the magic words, that's not okay. All right. And a couple of other things we've gotten to. Well, here's the thing. Maybe there'll be another live depending on what happens next week. And even if there isn't, I promise we'll, we'll still do lives. Maybe not with this frequency because I do want to get to some of your questions. There's a few more topics here that came up and who knows, maybe some of you will ask about them or I can toss them in at the end. Why don't we take some questions? How can I stop? Ah, this is a great, great question. How can I stop feeling pity and guilt about my narcissistic ex? So it's important first to understand the trauma bonded piece of this, right? Immediately, I was, um, I, I'm going to say something absolutely ridiculous to you, okay? Because I'm having this get together, I'm not good with music. This is, I'm going to come to an answer here. Um, and I was listening to like music to try to make a playlist for a party. And that's again, not my forte. And I'm like very old. And so I don't know. But I, um, the, a Mariah Carey song came up and I hadn't listened. It was, I, I can't live if living is without you. And I sort of stopped. My friend's like, what are you doing? Why are you listening to this song? I said, stop. And I was like, this is the most trauma bonded song I've ever heard. <clears throat> I can't live if living is without you, right? Trauma bonded. So let's, let's use that as our foreshadowing. I was thinking about it a lot last night. Part of that entire trauma bonded circumplex is this, these negative emotions. We feel bad for them. Because in a way, when you look at a narcissistic person, there's this very lost feeling to them that they actually seem genuinely upset. For example, when this relationship ends, think of what you were to them. 
You were their supply. You were in some ways their scaffold. With a vulnerable narcissistic person, you might have been actually their meaningful connection to the world in some cases. So feeling that pity and guilt is very, very normal. To me, it's number one, it's telling you those empathic parts of you are firing, but they might be firing too much, right? But it's okay. I'd rather they fire and they fire too much here, but you need to understand that piece of it. Number two, narcissistic people are so skilled at the whole victimhood thing. So they really know how to be that sad sack person that pulls on our wounds to want to rescue them. And there is sort of an unsupplied narcissistic person. Okay, I'm going to say this again. An unsupplied narcissistic person is one of the saddest things you'll ever see. Because as for the rest of us, who doesn't want adulation and praise? But there's going to be days we don't get it or worse. We're just going to get criticized all day. And if we have an internal self-soothing mechanism, we get ourselves through those days. We're like, eh, you know what? I'm going to have to distract myself or I'm going to go take a walk or I'm going to go do something else. But the narcissistic person becomes a deflated balloon when they're not supplied. And because it looks so sad, some become angry on those days, don't get me wrong. But the ones who don't get angry and just sort of get into that sort of collapsed state, it, think think Michael Scott on The Office is a great example of the deflated, unsupplied narcissist. Like anytime he got called out on anything, he'd become this pathetic person and everyone would scramble. It was like the office nailed that dynamic with that character. So that, how can you stop? First of all, you mean it's impossible to stop a feeling. So I think it's first of all, recognizing where it's coming from. Secondly, where are other places you felt like this in your life? Have there been other relationships where you feel, I feel bad for this situation? Number three, I need you to separate out the parts you feel responsible for. Sometimes we feel responsible for the narcissistic person feeling whatever negative victimized thing. You're not responsible for another adult's feelings. Your interaction with them may have contributed, but they're having a, they're having a, they're having an experience and that's their experience to soothe, to manage, to take responsibility for. This takes time. This is why some of the activities, like even writing it out, seeing if that, that state of pity and guilt shifts with time. And this is where that, I know it's an awful thing to do, but the ick list, writing down all the bad things that happened in the relationship. This thing didn't just end because you're a mean person. It ended because it was unhealthy. Maybe even they ended it. I don't know your story, but all the, especially seeing all the bad things that happen can give you context of, you can still feel bad, you're showing compassion, but you doesn't mean you have to go and be with it again and try and fix it. We can feel bad for someone and not have anything to do with them. Keep in mind that that's an option too. And in that way, you can allow that feeling to run through you. The danger is if the pity and guilt catapult you to wanting to deal with them again. Then have another question. I have family coming into my home for Easter weekend. Are there any tips for how to survive this time with an antagonistic person in my home? So yes, that's right. For a lot of you, it's coming into a time, for a lot of folks, a time of holiday. And um, how do you survive this? With the, and the, it sounds like if you say in my home, it means they might be staying in your home. Number one, you already know it's about to come. That's a big one. So big thing, talk about it in the book, preparing preparing for this happening is that you know that this person's going to come in. You're going to have to almost remind yourself, even if you put up cryptic post-its in your house, like you're going to, you're going to, don't go deep, don't defend, don't engage, don't explain, don't personalize, stick to the superficial topics. Don't talk about good things or bad things. Uh, talk mostly about them. Be curious about them. When they try to draw you in in a baity way, especially since you're all, it's an entertaining thing, keep yourself busy. Like try to find if there's ways, oh, I got to go, there's a, something burning on the stove. Oh, I got to go, someone's, uh, little kids need me in the backyard, whatever it may be. Oh, got to color more eggs. Whatever you got to do, I don't care if you have to color a hundred eggs, give them away. But keep yourself busy when they're trying to do that baiting. I also want you to make sure you build in a little bit of alone time and maybe in the bathroom and maybe offering, oh, we need more butter. I'll go get it. And that 10 minutes going back and forth to the grocery store could be a place to just some deep breathing, some centering. I got this. I can do this. If you have other touchstones, friends you can talk to, any other meditation practice, anything you do, a walk exercise that kind of just sort of breaks you out of it, even something pleasant you like, even if it's like a quick game you play on your phone or something you read or anything like that. 
all of those things, you the key is when you know you're going to be with someone who's very antagonistic is to be prepared. You don't want to be on your back foot with this. You know what you're about to deal with and you deal with, you're ready. Again, you just, just like you prepare for, you know, we might prepare our homes for a storm. It's the same thing. You're preparing your, your body for a storm. Recognize you're going to feel a lot of it in your body. So ground, like it's hand to the chest, it's breathing. It's, it's just, again, remembering that your body sometimes starts feeling this person, even while you're sort of trying to work it through in your mind, catch your body. Even if it's like a hand to the chest, hand to the pulse, something to ground your body, to breathe through it. You can get through it. But then when this Easter weekend is done, I don't care if it's an hour, half a day, something, give yourself a break to rest. Sometimes the best thing you can do is sleep. So I hope that's helpful. And um, like I said, do something, get, create a bunch of activities for yourself that day that will keep you busy and potentially away from that person. They're going to complain and nothing's going to be enough and all that. Are there cultural differences when it comes to narcissistic parents, such as we might see, for example, in an Asian culture? All personality is shaped by culture. So the personalities one culture may value may not be valued as much in another. I had a graduate student who works as part of this, of, of this team, and her graduate thesis was on, um, on introversion. And she did a phenomenal job of laying out a literature review talking about introversion in Latino culture. And her sample, we looked at the numbers like three times, like, how do you have so many introverts? And there was something culturally happening with this group of people she was studying who happened to be Mexican, Central American. And there's a very high rate of introversion, right? And just her and I together found that fascinating. So, that, and that's so it's something that might be potentially valued or their introversion was that they were very, in their tight family systems, they were connected, but not so much outside of that. In other cultures, a, a, certain kinds of personality styles might be connected to gender. So a person who's more like a woman in certain cultures who holds back on speaking, that might be more valued, that's going to get more developed, yet that may not work as well in another culture. So now this person's asking specifically about narcissistic parents in specific cultures. The, the demands in, in certain immigrant cultures, I say this is something that comes from a South Asian culture of these are often cultures within a family that are more hierarchical, they're more patriarchal, they're more authoritarian. Speaking out and, and sort of breaking ranks is completely not tolerated, which gives the narcissistic parent a lot of power. Emotion may get valued in a different way. So the expression of emotion, if there is too much emotion, that may be shamed. So that's happening at a systemic level, the way those things are recognized. That doesn't mean everyone in those cultures has a narcissistic parent. It means that already the society is supporting certain things. And then if you throw a narcissistic parent into the mix, those kinds of things might almost get to an unhealthy level. Absolutely no tolerance for expression of emotion. Absolutely no tolerance for breaking ranks. I think it gets much harder when you're trying to heal because you're able to make sense of why your parents might have done what they've done, right? Why, why they're where these pressures are coming from, throw immigration into there. And you'll say, well, they, and we had to succeed in a country that where we didn't fit in and all of that you can create a very thoughtful narrative, but their behavior still was a problem and it affected you and how you go through the world. Now, those two things can be true at the same time, but it does, because I think again, I, to your question, yes, the answer is yes, because culturally these patterns are going to show up differently and sometimes even be magnified because of the way that um because of the way that the culture actually values that particular pattern so i think that this is something we're starting to dig into in terms of research um and it's a it, narcissism's a really 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 difficult cross cultural thing to study but so much of the consultation i've done is with folks in asian cultures who've said and and folks also who work with asian immigrant um like uh a college student age, like young adult age people. And it's a big issue because there's also, you have this acculturation um, pressure and all of that, but there's definitely these added pressures when the culture sort of, if you will, almost supports narcissism. Doesn't mean everyone's narcissistic and it just means it's a multiplier. Let me take on another question. Can a narcissistic golden child who's also been, who's been parentified also be a people pleaser? Absolutely. This is a phenomenally wise, wise observation. The person who made this, not every, this is a, not all people pleasers are um, narcissism free because in this case, 
a people please people pleasing in a way in a narcissistic person is, is seeking out of supply, right? It's look, I'm great. And so this person is saying the golden child is actually narcissistic. Now, many, but not all, some golden children actually come up and feel a tremendous sense of shame at having been put into that role. But some golden children, probably more than in the other roles, become narcissistic. But this person adds in a little twist in this question, which is the golden child, who's narcissistic, was also parentified. And for those of you not familiar with that term, it means that from an early age, when the child wasn't developmentally ready, there were certain roles placed on that child that they could not, they wouldn't be able to manage, like listening to their parents share inappropriate information, like marital problems with them, or being put in the, in the, uh, having to take care of other kids in the family, <clears throat> or show up in in adult ways, and in, in like in terms of conversation or social settings. But that, and in some ways, and, and sort of in the more know, problematic, is that that golden child almost becomes like a, if you will, a companion. I don't mean that in a sexual way or anything. I mean like a, like the parent almost expects you to show up with them socially in a weird way. And it's, um, and it, it, it can really feel like a strange pressure as though for that child feels like they're chosen, but it's not an appropriate role for them to be in. So parentification can look a lot of different ways, depending on the situation. Sometimes it's again, role responsibilities, listening to the parent, um, having to sort of the child doesn't get to play, you know, they have to just sort of help a lot with chores and things like that. But a golden child is usually put into that more companion listening role. Then they can, and absolutely, you can see how this is a set up to being a people pleaser because the golden child is in a really, I always, in the book, <clears throat> I think I actually say they're on a perilous pedestal. They're put up on this pedestal in a way ahead of all other siblings but that golden child knows they could get knocked off that pedestal anytime if they don't keep playing the way the narcissistic parent wants, doing what they want, showing up the way they want, looking the way they want. And so it's sort of like you feel chosen, but it, you know it's a temporary chosen, which is a very unsettling feeling from an attachment perspective. So that people pleasing then can almost be sort of the golden child's, it could even, it may have even come up as a fond response, like that involuntary sort of sense of pleasing, but definitely it may also be if because if they're a narcissistic golden child, it may be a way to get supply and one that they've been indoctrinated to at a very early age. I'd, I'd need to know more about the situation. Why don't we take one, excuse me, one more. How do you forgive a betrayal trauma and then have to see the narcissistic person at an event? How do I get to that place in my healing? I think everyone in there, I hope you're in the chat saying, Dr. Romney is going to tell you, you don't need to forgive. You don't need to forgive. I don't think you need to. In fact, I think above all traumas, forgiving betrayal trauma, I don't know. I, 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 there's very little research that supports that that's a good idea. There's a lot of people touting on about forgiveness as the high road. I don't know. The high road is actually, if you fall off the high road, you're going to get hurt. Take the low road. It's a lot, it's a lot safer down here. But And I'm, when I say low road, I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I think of all the traumas to forgive, betrayal trauma may be the hardest because there are, there's the trauma that might happen at the hands of someone we don't know, right? We may not forgive that, but we may almost forget it. Like our body will hold it, but we don't know that person. The key to betrayal trauma is that that relationship was predicated on trust. Okay. Now I'm assuming the way you've written the question that it was likely a partner. Okay. So this is somebody who, if there was a spouse, they stood in front of a group of people and vowed to all these care and cherish and whatever the hell they vowed to do, that they've made a promise to you, that you upheld your side of the promise. And then they betray that trust. It is so difficult for us to process that because it's such a it's a punch in the gut in terms of survival needs. And it's a punch in the gut in terms of safety in the world. Even though like people say, come on, a person cheating, is that really safety in the world? It is, it is because you trusted this person. So what it does is it steals that ability to trust other people in the future. You better believe that safety in the world. We don't feel like we can trust. So it's hard for us to even build other relationships in our life where trust is important. That undercuts safety. How do you forgive that? That somebody has taken away your trust in yourself, your trust in making a decision about someone, your trust in future people. That's what, this isn't somebody lifting your wallet. This is big. This is big. I don't know how you forgive that. And I'm not so sure that you need to. You don't forgive them. You see them at an event. 
It is not going to be comfortable. You're going to feel all the physio physiological ick that runs through your body from top to bottom, the tightening in the throat, the beating heart, the punch in the gut. You might feel the, the a sense of a, a tingle. Everyone feels something different. Some people feel all of it. You might feel the air rushing out of your lungs. All of those things, might, your mouth might feel dry. This is a sympathetic nervous system response, okay? Know that that's going to happen. Get the Let's move the forgiveness out of here. Let's prepare you to go to this event, okay? Um, first of all, we're going to make sure you got to promise all of us right here on this live, you're going to look fabulous at this event. You're going to go out there, put, put yourself together. That's, that is you saying, you did not break me. Like I'm still coming out in the world. So that, that's one thing. Just we put our best selves out there. You don't need to get to that place. The place you need to get to is to say, I want to be at this event. I'm going to go. And this person isn't taking this away from me. Sympathetic nervous system, thank you so much. I understand why you're telling me this is a threat, but I got this. I've get, seen this happen many, many times with folks, and that I actually literally prepared clients for these events who didn't forgive. They tried a whole bunch of techniques to manage the event, going with friends, paying attention to the room, having the friend pay attention to the room and say, hey, maybe it's time to go to the bathroom, and being guided so you didn't have to deal with them. You can absolutely endure getting through this without forgiving them. And showing up at the event doesn't mean you've forgiven them. Showing up at the event means you're living your life, which you have every right and frankly need to do. So coming to the event doesn't mean you've forgiven them. Coming to the event means you're living your life. You can gray rock the hell out of this one. Hello, I'm fine. If you even have to talk to them in an ideal world, I don't know how big or small the event is. If it's small, it's going to be hard to avoid them, but it can be perfunctory. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's at all, all as well. Um, I got to jump. There's always, I got to jump. You may never get to the place you're in your, you do not need to forgive to heal. I have, in fact, many people heal a little more smoothly when they don't forgive because they feel like well, this is not authentic for me to heal. So I'm not going to do it. And, and then some people say, I got, I'm literally indifferent to this person. Do I forgive them? I don't know. I don't care what happens to them. It's, it's whether it's indifference, whether you forgive, whether you don't forgive those paths, it doesn't, the forgiveness isn't going to make the healing easier. And if you're not doing it authentically, it's going to make your healing harder. You're putting too much of the focus of your healing right now on the forgiving the betrayal trauma. You were betrayed. That wasn't okay. You'll get to where you get to, but please don't make that a condition of this. It's okay. It doesn't, and all these people are like, well, you're carrying the poison. You're not carrying the poison. You're carrying a reality. This person likely didn't do this to you once either. So you're carrying a reality and that it's not okay to come into someone's life and claim you love them and do this to them. Like that's not forgiving someone as actually in some ways recognizing that's not okay. It's not okay. And no, I still resent you. And this harmed me. So you don't tell them, you tell yourself. And someday, like I said, when your healing gets to a place you are in, a, you feel like I'm really strongly in my full self. I'm good. And then you'll say, okay, sure, I forgive them. But in most cases, for most of us, it's not that we forgive. It's just we don't give a damn anymore. So hold on to that. Give yourself permission and, and give yourself permission to go to the event. Recognize your body's going to feel like the 4th of July. And that's just your poor nervous system saying, oh, that's dangerous. Yeah. And you can say, I got you. I hear, I, I'm, I got, I'm completely, we, we're going to be able to manage this together. You and me, sympathetic nervous system, bring that wide, wise mind, that cortical functioning online. You'll be able to do this. And I, I, I just, I want you to even have the experience of the strength, but you don't need to forgive. And if you do, and you genuinely mean it, then that's your path. And that's great too. It's not that one is better. Whatever path that feels authentic to you is the right one. So I'm going to have to close this out because I actually do. I'm going to now end up being late to this appointment. So I want to thank you all. Again, I'm not going to do another one today because I actually have something to do all day. So I have to go in with these folks that are in from out of town. So anyhow, remember today, let's see. Let, uh, we get it on the list another week. We do. If we don't, we don't. We've already exceeded expectations, but I am seeing through a promise I made. So I, it's, it's, it's a big thing to me to, to do that. So remember, if you do order the book, if you're new to this community and like, oh, I didn't know I could get all this free stuff. Yes, you can. So if you order the hard copy or the ebook today, 
before midnight in your time zone, very quickly verify that purchase. Then we'll give you access to a six hour live virtual retreat and you'll be entered into a raffle to win. Five people will win these teas with Dr. Romani, which I'm now beginning to realize <laughs> take me a while to get through all these, but I shall. Um, you will get a, um, a, a signed book. Uh, some, some of you will win a signed book. Some of you will win book boxes. Some of you will win other things. It just depends, you know, we just go all random who's going to win what. So please, you know, we'd get, get, get your books. If you haven't already, if you want to get one for a gift, this is the time um, it's on sale. And um, thank you again, no matter what happens, I, it, this, the word has gotten out. I think we've really sort of created a ripple in a pond where people have not been paying attention to this. Your questions are magnificent. Um, your ideas for topics are magnificent. I still have some. So if something strange happens next week and this book kind of holds its own, we'll be sort of barraging you with lives again next week. Um, and uh, if not, I might kind of give myself a little bit of a rest um, and then my voice a little bit of a rest too. So thank you again, again, your questions, your thoughtfulness and the progress I'm seeing. The way people are asking questions, it shows me there's there's some tremendous insight that, like I said, that exceeds that of a lot of people who've been doing this kind of um, work in the field for a while. So congratulate yourselves on that too. So again, thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. I think in LA here, there's a marathon tomorrow. So if anyone's running that good luck and good luck and um and whatever it is you're doing as spring is coming around the bend next week enjoy this last weekend of winter as i always feel there's so much hope in spring um and for some of you you're sort of veering into fall but either way it's a really nice transitional time when the earth is balanced so i hope that you feel that in your body too thank you again and have a beautiful day